the citizens of Austria, they didn't know quite what to do. Napoleon's massive army was preparing to attack this small city. Soldiers were spotted by the heights of the, of the hills around this little town, which was situated near the Austrian border. A council of citizens quickly called a meeting to the local church to discuss what they should do. Do they try to muster up their own strength, though they are very small in number, and just die their deaths with courage and dignity? Or do they simply raise the white, white flag of surrender and give up to Napoleon's army that was crouching near? And it happened to be Easter Sunday when they gathered together, and the people decided to seek the Lord and their pastor as to what they should do. And the pastor uh, arose and said, Brothers and sisters, we have been counting on our own strength for too long. And apparently that has failed us. And as this day is the day of our Lord's resurrection, let us ring the bells of this chapel loudly and with courage. And let us have our worship services as usual and leave this matter into the hands of God. We know only our weaknesses, and now let us seek the power of God to defend us. And so the people accepted this plan and rang the church bells loudly and with faith. And they worshipped. They worshipped for the next couple hours. And the enemies, hearing the sudden peal of loud bell ringing, thought that the Austrian army had arrived during the nights to defend this small town. And by the time the service ended, Napoleon's army broke camp, dispersed, and left. And the town celebrated in victory because they knew that the victory belonged to the Lord. And in a similar way, as we worship... And God loves to dwell within the praises of his people. The enemy flees because light is always stronger than darkness. No matter how thick and prevalent the darkness may be, the smallest spark of light will drive darkness away. Light is always stronger than darkness. Amen? And so as we also look to this example of this church, yes, they praise him because of the victory that they experienced. But also, Jesus has won the victory already for us at the cross. That is why we worship. We worship because the enemy has already been defeated. We worship because Jesus is the victor. And we worship because Jesus is worthy of our praises. Amen? And so for this people in Austria... They worshipped and God fought for them and brought victory. But another reason, the more prominent reason why we worship is because the victory has already been won. And last week we saw in chapter 4 of Revelation that John was given a vision of heaven and he saw in heaven a throne and our mighty God who sits on that throne and the glorious beauty that surrounded this majestic God. He saw and beheld the beauty of our God. And with that, he blessed the majesty of his mightiness. And through that, he bowed down in surrender to his sovereignty. And this next chapter in chapter 5, it's a continuation. He continues on describing what he saw. And while last week focused on God, our creator... This week, it focuses on Jesus, our Redeemer. So he is worthy, and we'll explore the worthiness of Jesus Christ and the worthiness of the Lamb as we see more worship displayed in heaven. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Also, follow along with me in your outlines as we see today the song of heaven that declares worthy is Jesus, the Lamb of God. And so today we see that worthy is the Lamb because Jesus holds all authority. So everyone repeat, Jesus holds all authority. Chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 1. 
Let's read that together, shall we? Ready to begin? Then I saw in the right hand of him who is seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So the first thing that we see here, we'll pause there, is that a scroll is in the hand of God. Now, what is this scroll? There are various uh, possibilities that scholars discuss, but the most probable is that it is the complete story of redemptive history. The coming plans that will be unfolded in the chapters to come and in the years to come to complete God's redemptive story from creation to the fullness of recreation. That is in the scroll. And once that scroll is, the seals are broken and it is unraveled, that will be the fullness of all the plans and purposes of God that is released within the world. And also this scroll seems to be in the form of a title or deed, but ultimately in the form of a will, as in the will or a testament of a deceased person. It has many similarities to a will because in that day, wills were also often summarized by the back. And so verse 1, we see that there was also writing on the back. And so that gives us hints that it may be a will, but also wills back then were often signed with multiple people and many times with seven people having their signet ring or signet signature stamp the seal to ensure its authenticity. And only with the death of the one who has written the will could the seals be broken and all that was written in this will to become legal and empowered to execute all that the person who wrote it desired. And that's the same as today. Uh, you may write a will, anybody may write a will, but it's not powerful, legal, or effective until that person has passed away. Now that's going to serve some importance for us later on. And not only is the seven seals important with paralleling what has happened in their time and day with wills, but also seven, as you may recall, is the perfect number. It is the number symbolizing fullness of time or completion, perfection. Now let's look at verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy or who has proper authority? It's not talking about moral worthiness, like do you deserve, are you good enough to do this? But it's referring to authority. Who has the legal, proper power and authority to open this? So who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? So who has the authority to open this? Verse 3 and 4, And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So no one amongst all of God's creation is able to execute God's plan of redemption through judgment of sin through the redemption of mankind this cannot be fulfilled in its fullness through anything that God has created or through anyone God has created and so out of love and longing for the purposes of God we see that John the beloved disciple of Jesus weeps he is weeping because he longs and loves the plans of God he longs for them to be fulfilled and this is a reflection of how much G John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, loved the things that God loved. He sees these are the plans of God. This is the purpose of God. And is there no one who is worthy, who has the authority to bring about the fullness of God's plans? And no one was worthy. And he weeps. And oh, how we would be such a resonating generation with the things of God's heart that we would love the plans and purposes of God. That we would long to see God's will fulfilled in our lives, in the lives of our brothers and sisters, in the lives of this world to long. God, I want to see your will accomplished. That when you see sickness and disease and illness, that you are longing for the kingdom to come in power. That just as Jesus declared and commissioned his disciples to lay hands on the sick, to speak forth miracles to happen, that we would long to see his kingdom come in a greater measure of power. To long to see 
the will of God, the purposes of God. And when that does not happen, we weep because the world is missing out on seeing his kingdom come. Amen. May we be a weeping generation that weeps for the things that God's heart breaks for and weeps when we do not see his will accomplished in the lives of our own loved ones. Verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the roots of David, has conquered. And this verb that he's using in conquered means completely conquered, complete victory, total conquer and victory. It says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered completely, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So one of the elders approaches John, says, Do not weep, do not worry. There is someone who is worthy. And behold, you will see him soon. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, taken from Genesis 49. He is the root of David, taken from Isaiah 11. And both of these titles are conquering names for the Messiah who will come to destroy his enemies through judgment. That the Messiah, the mighty Messiah, the strong Messiah is a lion from the tribe of Judah. That he is from the roots of the most powerful king Israel has ever known. He will descend from the throne of David. A powerful savior from the most powerful divine family line has conquered. Jesus is worthy to open the scroll and to have his will accomplished because he holds all power and authority in his hands. Matthew 28, Jesus even proclaims of himself, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus Christ is worthy to have authority because he holds all power, all rule, all titles, all supremacy belongs to him. Amen? So that is what he is proclaiming, what this elder is proclaiming here, that he is worthy to break the seals and to bring about his judgments because he has all authority. He is the lion. He is the king. He is the reigning Messiah. He is worthy for he holds all power and authority in his hands. Amen? And so that's an important thing that we need to establish. Who is worthy? No one else in all creation is worthy. But Jesus, the Lamb, to open these seals and bring about the fullness of God's redemptive historical plan. He is worthy because he holds all authority, but also he is worthy because Jesus redeemed humanity. So everyone repeat, Jesus redeemed humanity. So he redeemed humanity for the elect, for the people of God. So there was great anticipation for the Jewish people uh, again, with all the prof prophecies from Old Testament times that the coming Messiah was going to come in power. Again, he's going to be the lion from the tribe of Judah. And what do you think of when you think of lion? You think of ferocious, powerful, strong, right? Like Aslan. But although in the movie he looks a little bit cuddly, right? He is worthy. He holds all authority. A lion, a conqueror. Now, it's important to understand the buildup here because of the language that we'll be studying. So up until now, there is language that is used to anticipate a powerful figure. Lion, wow, victory, Messiah, strong, victory. One who has all authority, a conquering lion. And then verse 6, and between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. As, it has been, as if it's been slain. And so now realize, this is intentional. Because again, the elder is saying, Weep not, John. Don't fear. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he is worthy. He has conquered. Look and behold, I saw a lamb. And it's, it looks like it's slain. It's kind of like in Shrek 2, if, so for those of you guys who saw Shrek 2, when Puss uh, in Boots is first introduced. And if you guys remember, he was actually built up 
in terms of anticipation in a very similar way. All of a sudden, you know, Shrek and Donkey, they're like, you got to meet this guy. And all of a sudden he's like, he's in the shadows. He's lurking this master swordsman, this mighty valiant war who slays people by the thousands. Shadows lurking, cloak is around him and suddenly they show him and then it's this little kitten. And then he has these eyes and meow, right? And then all of a sudden you're like, what the, where, where, where's the warrior, right? And there's a f- similar contrast that's being built up, and we'll explain the significance in a moment. So we expect a lion from the tribe of Judah, and we see a lamb that was slain. But it is not just a lamb. It is a lamb not just that was slain. Why this lamb? This is the lamb that was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 53, 7, where he was led as a sheep to the slaughter to be the sacrifice for God's people. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this slain lamb is the picture of the sacrificial Passover lamb that we read about in Exodus. And this Passover sacrificial lamb is not a weak lamb. It holds great significance, and we'll get to this very soon. But in order for you to understand a pictorial significance of this, let me share for you a true story that happened on November 26th, 2008, just a couple of years ago. A gang of Islamic uh, terrorists stormed the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel. And over 200 people died on that day. And there was a dining hall within this hotel that these terrorists just burst on the scene and just started firing and shooting, not in the sky, not in the ceiling, towards every single person, every guest that was at this dining hall. And an Indian-born English actor told of how he and his friends were eating in this dining hall at their table when suddenly all of a sudden they heard all these guns and these bullets flying everywhere. And afterwards, the next thing he remembers after hearing these gunshots is somebody just dragging him under the table on the floor. And then for the next several moments, literally, they're walking table to table, just shooting every single person that was in this dining hall until everybody was killed, or so they thought. They shot through every single person, not wanting anyone to leave. And once they left, the dust settled, uh, reporters came in, police came in, all these things, and they found one person survived, this actor. And they interviewed him, saying, how in the world are, is it that everybody in your table died, everybody in this whole hall died, how did you survive? And they asked him, I mean, were you playing dead? This was his response. He goes, yeah, I, I guess uh, they thought I was dead. And then to which the reporter asked, so you mean you played dead, you just didn't move? Uh, he says, yeah, but more than that, I was covered in someone else's blood. And that is what saved me. Someone else's blood saved this actor from death. And that is the picture of the significance of the lamb that is slain for the people of God. You see, plagues in the Exodus time came to bring judgment, destruction, and death to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And when the plague of death of the firstborn was released, only those who had the blood of the lamb covering the doorpost were saved. They were saved from death. And in the coming chapters of Revelation, which we will see in the coming weeks, we will see another set of plagues that will be released from heaven through the scroll through what will be uh, transpired in the will of God for the end times of the world. Only those whose lives have been covered with the blood of the Lamb of God will be saved from the next plagues and from ultimate death. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, are you covered with the blood? Are you covered with the blood of the Lamb that was slain? You see, judgment, death, and destruction will come, but only those who are covered with his blood will be saved. And that is why John, the same writer of Revelation, 
writes in his book of the gospel, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look to the Lamb because he will save you. Look to the Lamb because his blood will save you. Call upon his name and you will be saved. Amen. So continuing on in verse 6. Jesus is a lamb, and not only that, he has seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent into all the earth. And again, the number seven signifies perfection, completeness, or fullness. And horns were a symbol of power. So before you think, as you look at a lamb that is slain, that you think he's a weak, vulnerable creature, the lamb of God is one of great power. Again, seven is perfection. Horns represent strength. This Lamb of God has perfect divine strength. This shows that this is not just a Lamb of physical strength, but one of spiritual strength that echoes the words of God, that not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And again, the seven spirits are God, uh, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And all the seven eyes are the all-knowing, the perfect seeing God who represents the spirit who goes throughout the world seeking hearts who are wholly his. Verse 7 and 8, and he looked and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. So Jesus in his rightful authority takes the scroll from the hand of God the Father Verse 8, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and, a go and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now that is fascinating. The golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. When we pray and worship, we affect the activities in heaven. Did you know that? That when you pray to the Lord, when we worship together as a people, we affect the activities in heaven. God cherishes prayer. God collects our prayers in golden bowls. Our prayers affect heaven's worship and impacts life on earth. Prayer does something not just on earth. It affects heaven. Prayers are powerful, prayers are precious to God, and prayers become a part of the worship celebrations of heaven. Amen? This is a fascinating revelation, a glimpse, not just into heaven, not just into heavenly worship, but into how our prayers and our worship is viewed and used in heavenly worship. So praying is never in vain, people of God. He collects them. He cherishes them. And they will be used not only to accompany the worship of heaven, it is through our prayers that are collected in these golden bowls that will one day be released to affect the activities of earth through answered prayers. It is never a waste to pray. God cherishes them. They are precious and powerful in the eyes of God. Amen? So now let's look at verse 9 once again. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were, what? Slain. And by your blood you ransomed people. And look at verse 6 again. Go back up to verse 6. It says, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So the emphasis on this chapter, in Revelation chapter 5, the emphasis of the worthiness of Jesus Christ is found in his death of being slain. Now, of course, the resurrection of Jesus is precious, and that is significant, and we will celebrate that later on in this book. But for the, this portion of Revelation, it shows us that the death of Jesus Christ was also a victory. The death and slaying of the Lamb was also significant in victory for salvation because through death and suffering, salvation happens. The death of Jesus Christ was just as necessary as his resurrection. 
It was just as important for Jesus to die, not just resurrect. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Only, the only way the penalty and wrath of God was to be appeased is through the shedding of, uh, of blood through a death. Okay, so for example, so sin, sin happens. And because sin happens, there must be the death penalty. That is the spiritual law. So if sin happens, there must be a death penalty. Somebody must die because of this. And so once there is a death, that judgment is satisfied. And then there is peace. So that is what is significant. Because as Jesus took our place, we should have gone through the death penalty. And just like in the, the real law court systems that we have face today, if we go through a death penalty, if that is the verdict, somebody must die in order for people to move on. And Jesus' death satisfied the penalty for our sins. Amen? And through that, sin's power to hold us, to grip us in death, because the wages of sin is death, sin's power is gone. So through the death of Jesus, sin's power is gone. Amen? The power of death is gone. Satan is defeated forever. It is not that Satan will one day be defeated. Satan is already defeated through the death of Jesus and the resurrection. So he is a defeated foe, period. No qualification needed. Satan is defeated. Death's power and sin's power is gone at the cross. And so we celebrate. Worthy is the Lamb who died for us. And also, as we remember, only after a death, again, why is the death so significant? Another reason? Only after a death can a will be empowered and executed. And so Jesus had to die in order for this will, this scroll from heaven, to be executed and fulfill the rest of human uh, salvation. Also, after Christ's death, the will of completing redemption's history can begin. So he is worthy. He is worthy also because through this slaying and suffering, God reveals that he is a suffering God. He is the suffering servant who came to save the world. Because even suffering serves the sovereign plan of God in our lives. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19 says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This reveals that there is a suffering that is a part of God's will for our lives. But in the midst of it, we trust in our faithful God. He says, therefore, let all who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls, trust in their faithful creator while doing good. Show that you trust God in the midst of your suffering by doing his will, by doing good, by proclaiming goodness and grace. That is how we honor God. And he is revealing that not only is there a form of suffering that is a part of God's will, but despite the chaos and confusion because of our sin and suffering in this world, there is a divine plan being fulfilled in our lives and in this fallen world that is awaiting the return of our king. Our Savior is a conquering king. Yes, he is victorious. He is almighty. He has all authority. That is Jesus. But also, he is a suffering king. He chose to suffer. He chose to embrace suffering so that he will not be a distant God observing a suffering people that, oh, I feel your pain. I am so sorry for that. He chose to become flesh. And Jesus is still to this day fully flesh. 
He is human and fully God. He chose to be human and experience all the pain, suffering, and death that this fallen world offers. So that through his death and sacrifice and slaying, we would not have to die for all eternity. He is not just a victorious king. He is a suffering king. So he knows your pain. He knows rejection. He knows pain. He knows persecution. He knows torture. And he knows death. So that we would never have to die. Amen? Worthy is the Lamb that was slain so that we would not have to be slain. Jesus knows suffering. At the center of it all was a Savior who chose to experience suffering with us and for us. Amen? There is purpose for suffering in the lives of believers. You may not know and understand its fullness in terms of why until eternity, but we trust his word and we trust that he is good. Amen. Verse nine, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The heart of God, the heart of creation of why all of this happened, the heart of God's redemptive salvation history is that of missions, that his desire is to see all the peoples and languages and tribes that he created that are his people to be redeemed and saved and bless his holy name. And so if we love and behold this beautiful God and exalt his supremacy over all things, that we desire the things that he loves. If you love this God, I want you to receive more of it. That is why we are on missions, because we love Jesus. And because we know that he's died, this is what heaven sings of. Heaven is singing and in celebration of the mission heart of God for every people group, for every nation of this world to know this loving Savior that was slain for us. And not only that, look at verse 10. Not only did he come to save us, that would be more than enough for us simply just to be with Christ for eternity. Verse 10, and on top of that, again, they're just worshiping because they're looking at the beauty of Christ, the beauty of redemption, the beauty of salvation history, that you purchase people from, and look around this room, from Australia, from South Africa, from Egypt, from all these places. God, you redeem these people, and not just that, verse 10, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. We're not just saved. We're going to be serving and ruling with him. We are priests, a royal nation, a holy priesthood. We are bestowed great honor, great service, great privilege, great responsibility to rule with him, to work with him, to work for him for eternity. Amen? What a mighty God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. The fact that we know him, that we are here, that our parents and our families and people of our ethnic group, of our native countries, that there are people praising him, and that is because of the merciful, gracious mission heart of God. What a mighty God we serve. He didn't have to. What did we do? We did nothing. We curse him. 
We ignore him. We spit in his face. We don't give a crud as to what he has to say in our lives. And he still chose us. God's amazing. Jesus is amazing. And so because Jesus holds all authority, and because Jesus redeemed humanity of his elect and provided a way of salvation, Jesus deserves all glory. Everyone repeat, Jesus deserves all glory. Amen? He has all authority. He is the greatest power. He is the greatest God. And I praise him that there is no one other like him, that there is no other God but him, that he is on the throne. This good, righteous, merciful, sovereign, supreme, humble king is on the throne of the universe who rules and reigns. And simply out of mercy and love, he gave his son to be the sacrificial lamb to save us, that we might not just be with him, that we might rule with him and receive reward and crown and honor from him. Grace upon grace, lavishing goodness upon goodness, gift after gift. He deserves all glory. God, you are amazing. How can we not praise him? Verse 11. Let's read verse, uh, let's read verse 11 and 12 together, shall we? Ready to begin? Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And you feel this. They're like, you are worthy. Oh, my goodness. We bless you. You are awesome. Bless you, Jesus. Because he deserves it all. They're like, I wish I knew more vocabulary to throw at you. Because you became sin who knew no sin so that we might become your righteousness. What kind of God is that? What kind of God is that? Who becomes sin, who knew no sin so that sinners might become his righteousness and his children. Jesus is awesome. He is worthy of all. He is worthy of all glory. He is worth more than anything in this world. Jesus is worthy. Amen. Verse 13, and I heard every creature. So now everybody's joining in with these elders and these living creatures that were closest to Jesus and God around the throne and then all of creation joins in because when they are beholding the beauty of God, what did we learn last week? You cannot help but bless His majesty. And as they are hearing of the greatness of God, they and all the rest of creation, they want to join in too. They're like, I want to bless our awesome God too. And they are singing. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, meaning everyone, everywhere, all over the place, in the sea and all that is in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. They sing in celebration of the greatness of a God. Don't you just want to sing right now? I just want to sing. I just want to invite the praise and come up, and I, that's the most natural response right now. But we'll hold off a little bit more. You know, Eugene Peter says the songs that these people were singing were everywhere in Scripture. The people of God sing. 
They express exuberance in realizing the majesty of God and the mercy of Christ. Hymns gather the voices of men, women, children into the century. Tried choruses, Moses sings, Miriam sings, Deborah sings, David sings, Mary sings, angels sing, Jesus and his disciples sing, Paul and Silas sing when persons of faith become aware of who God is and what he does and the beauty of all that he is. They sing. Sing. The songs are irrepressible because of the majesty of all that God is. Verse 14, and the four living creatures said, Amen! As they hear the song celebrating the risen and slain Savior of all of mankind, they're like, how beautiful is the cross? How beautiful are your scars? For they are forever symbols of your matchless grace and love for all of mankind. And so they say, Amen. They hear this blessed praise, glory, power. They say, Amen. And they say, Worthy are you of all glory, power, praise, honor. And they say, Amen. Excuse me. <laughs> Getting excited there. You see, the beginning and the end of all true praying and worshiping is a grand amen. And what does that mean again? It means, yes, God, let it be, Lord. Let what you want to be done, let that be done. That is what we are saying when we are saying amen. We are saying yes to God. The end result of worship is that our lives are changed because of the glory of God. And no longer do we say no to God. All of our lives are yes to God. This is a sign that we have seen the beauty of the Lamb that was slain. There are no more no's in our vocabulary when we talk to God. Unless he says, do you mind doing this? No. No. There are no more no's, only yes and amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Yes, Lord, because you are the lamb who suffered and died to take away my sins. Yes, Lord, you have your way in my life. Amen? Yes, Lord. Because he is the lamb that suffered and was slain and died to take our sins, he is worthy. You see, the horror of slaughter made him the hero to our souls for all eternity. It was the horror of the slaughter that brought salvation for our souls. You know, there's a story of a teenage daughter who hated being seen in public with her mom. Because her mom's arms were t and hands were f terribly disfigured, uh, very grotesque to look at. And so, again, as most teenagers during the, that adolescent time, you know, you, you want to be cool, you know, you don't want to embarrass yourself. So she was really ashamed to ever be seen in public with her mom. You know, one day her mom took uh, her daughter shopping, and so she agreed simply because she was going to get something from her mom there's something that she wanted at the store so her mom would buy it, so she agreed, even though, again, she's usually embarrassed to be seen with her. So she kind of kept a distance from the cash register as her mom pays for this clothing item that was for her daughter. And as the mom uh, give, reaches out and gives money to the store clerk, the clerk is about to reach for it, and then he just startles and gasps out of shock at the utter disgusting nature of the mom's uh, hands and arms. And once... The daughter saw the reaction of the store clerk. She just ran out of the store, embarrassed. And they got home. And later when they were home, um, the mom decided finally it was time to tell her daughter how her arms and her hand got so disfigured. And this is what she told her. You know, when you were a baby, I, I woke up to a burning house. Your room was an inferno. Flames were everywhere. I could have gotten out of the front door and saved myself very quickly, but I decided I'd rather die with you 
than to leave you to die alone. And so I ran through the fire and wrapped my arms around you. Then I went back through the same flames and my arms were lit on fire. And when I got outside onto our front lawn, the pain was agonizing. But when I looked at you and saw that you were okay, all I could do was rejoice that the flames did not touch you. Stunned, the girl looked at her mother through new eyes. Weeping in shame and gratitude, she kissed her mother's hands and arms for the first time because she realized it was through those slaughtered arms of love she was alive today. That is the beauty of the cross. That is the glory of the slaughtered lamb. It is through his slaughter we are saved. It is because he was slaughtered we are not. Worthy is the lamb. Let's pray.